Christ, who this is church, who he had to write two letters to them because they were pretty conflicted. And so this is from his second letter to that church. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us but life in you. So last week I spoke about springing into new life and, and what it's like to have a to be born and to grow up and to kind of get to that point where you're in high school or college and you start realizing that it's not all about yourself, but it's about others. And that's where we come to now here, the summer of life. I mentioned last week that it's very appropriate for us in the springtime of our life uh, to have some selfishness and self-centeredness. It's, it's important for us to develop a sense of self in, in opposition to what others may think of us, in opposition to what our parents want to make us. And so, you see, we're born totally dependent on others. And then we reach early adulthood, and we are now thrust into this belief system that we have to care for others uh, and know that we are different from our parents and different from uh, what they may make us. So the tricky thing in this next season of life is that we have to move beyond ourselves. We move from being born to adulthood trying to figure out some questions like, what is it that I'm going to do with my life? Who am I? Who am I going to love? These are the three important questions I think we ask throughout our life. And in the second season of life, what I like to call the summer of love, it's a time that we wake to the understanding that there are other people who depend on us. Now, for most people, that understanding comes when we fall in love. We, we fall in love, and then we want to, we know that other people depend on us for love, too. And so it's a give and take, right? How many of you think marriage is that? It's a give and take, right? Or, and hopefully that it is. At least not hopefully take, take, take. Um, so other people have that experience a little bit earlier. Maybe you've moved from being just an employee, and then you are the supervisor. And it was funny, Sharon Ferguson was at the first service, and I started mentioning this, that when you become the boss, you start realizing that everybody wants something from you. And, 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 and she was just shaking her head and saying amen. Because it's true, you know, when you become a, a boss over others, a supervisor over others, you realize that people are dependent on you uh, to get through their days. Or maybe it's when we understand that a group sometimes is more important than our own selfish ambition. And that's when we maybe unite on, on a team, or maybe we are, are part of something greater than ourselves with the church, that, that we are all realize that, that we are interdependent on one another. Now, for even others, it's taking care of a relative. Maybe raising your brother or sister's children, or caring for an ill parent. And I remember having a conversation with some of the older people in our church who at the age of 11 or 12, when a, when a parent died, they had to be the older brother or the older sister who raised the rest of the children. And how crazy that is, to be thrust into that role at the age of 13 to realize that you have other people dependent on you. You see, the, the summer of love is about realizing that life is not all about us. It's not all about my goals or ambitions. We enter into this next stage of life realizing that we are all interdependent. And we were younger, the summer of love can be a lot of fun. Can I hear an amen to that when you're young? You fall in love with that first time. It is great, isn't it? It's also great uh, in our 20s and our 30s when, you know, there's a lot of accomplishments that come our way in that time. You graduate. You get a diploma. You, you're hired for the first time at a job, and you get that job that you love. You, you get married. You have babies. And these are markers that say that we are, have made it in our, we are a success, right? But it's in the summer of love that we get to answer those three questions I talked about earlier. Who am I? Who do I love? What will I do? It's really only in the early part of our summer of love that we get to answer those on our own. We are independent. 
We are no longer just a copy of our parents. We've rejected or accepted what they've taught. And in the summer of love, we develop our sense of self. And then we realize that by marriage or by relationships or, or through our becoming a parent or in our work life, others need us. And as we grow older, that fun can wear off. We aren't affirmed by others as much as we once were. All of a sudden, we're 15 years into a, a career, and we haven't gotten a promotion, and we wonder, is this it? Or maybe you get that promotion, and then you realize, oh, it's not that great. Just get paid a little bit more, but it's the same job. Or, or maybe uh, our marriages or the diplomas just gather dust. And what was exciting in the beginning becomes a blur or a slog, depending on what's happening in our life at the time. And I, and I have to pause right here, because I'm a 43-year-old white male, working in a profession that I love, happily married to a smart, beautiful woman, a father to two amazing children who I enjoy learning about each day. Yes, they drive me nuts, but there are times when I close the door behind me and I have to, have to laugh, because Wesley is exactly like I was at his age. And, and all those curses that my parents had at me say, just wait till you have your own kids, come back to me, and I realize, yep, that's how it is. But there are times and circumstances, even in my life, that can feel overwhelming. So what I may say may be particular to my experience, and, and maybe you have different experiences than I do, and, and, and I hope that every moment of your life is as exciting as that first time you fell in love or received your first job or achieved that great promotion. I mean, I, if you have that, tell me the secret to make life like that all the time, because that would be great. But I have a feeling that most of you, at some point, have felt a little stuck, haven't you? And I have a sneaking suspicion that what I'm saying is resonating with you on, on some level. You see, as I was thinking about this sermon series, I was wondering what scripture would fit with where I am right now in my life. And I realized that these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that Paul is writing to a church in conflict were very similar to how I feel. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Now, I know I'm taking these verses out of context. This is about a church in conflict, not about my own personal life. But there are times when I feel afflicted in every way. I feel perplexed. I, I feel persecuted. And I... I feel struck down. Can I hear an amen to anybody who's felt that way in your life? Amen. amen. Sociologists like to call people in their 30s and 40s the sandwich generation. On one hand, a lot of us in our 30s and 40s are raising children. And on the other hand, we are often called to, to care for our aging parents. Anybody experience that? We're, you have parents, and you're worried about, and you got kids you're worried about, and then you're like, well, I can't worry about myself. I don't have time, right? And, and as I've lived in this area, I've realized that some of you are in your 50s or 60s who are caring for your parents. And there are people in their 50s and 60s who are raising their grandchildren in this community. And so that sandwich generation that the sociologists talk about is not just for people in their 30s and 40s. It's, it could be people in their 50s and 60s also as we are hard-pressed on every side and feel crushed and perplexed. It's no wonder uh, that the stress can be so powerful. It's no wonder that many people experience marital disharmony, maybe seven years in or, or 10 years in or 15 years into their marriage, because they are stressed on all these other levels and they just don't have time to give to their spouse. Now, as the summer of love goes a little longer, I kind of I use, chose this image because it's like this. How many of you are really excited at the beginning of summer? School, kids just got out, and you're ready to go on your vacations, right? And then all of a sudden around July, when you have about two weeks until school starts, you start freaking out. Anybody, any parents out here? You're like, oh, no, i got to go to that. What happened to our summer? <laughs> How many of you are in that period of life right now? What happened? to where I was in my 20s and 30s when I was so excited about life and excited about my job and excited about my marriage each and every day. And the truth is, as the summer of love continues, we will see our children leave the nest. 
We'll experience the death of mentors and friends and relatives who have brought us to where we are. And if our marriages and if our friendships survive those tumultuous years, we'll notice that the love that we have, that, that, that really quickly came and was passionate in our 20s and 30s, well, it's changed a little bit. It's something a little more substantial. It's no longer a, a selfish or a passionate love. Rather, it's a love that sustains and builds up another person and cares for another person very deeply. And the truth is, we give of ourselves so deeply and fully to our parents and our children and our friends and our spouses. And we gain wisdom about what love, what love is and what love is not. Now, how many of you in your marriage heard the words from 1 Corinthians 13? Love is patient, love is kind. You know, and the thing is, as a preacher, when I say those words, I'm really like I'm praying the whole time. I really hope they understand what I'm talking about here. Uh, because uh, most times, within a year or two, you're like, wait a minute, i got to be patient with this person? What do you mean love's not selfish? What do you mean it doesn't keep any record of rights and wrongs? I did the dishes five times last week. You know, that's kind of how love has to change. And maybe we understand 1 Corinthians 13 a different way when we've gone through all what we've gone through. And we understand what God tells us in Genesis when God takes a look at all of creation and says, it is very good. Because we realize that, that if we are very good, and we know how bad we mess up, that God must be a great loving God. That love is much deeper than we could ever imagine before. So physically and emotionally, the summer of love is that time of our greatest ability, our, our greatest resilience, and our greatest strength. We may not think that. We may feel tired. We may feel frustrated. But the reality is that we are at our peak uh, in these ages from 20, mid-20s to wherever you want to put the end date, depending on how old you are, right? This is our, our strongest we are. But spiritually, we might get stuck. Here's a, a professor at Emory, uh, he's actually not dead, but he was there in the 1980s and 90s and 2000s. And this, uh, this guy, Reverend Dr. James Fowler, wrote a book called The Stages of Faith. And he says that when we're in our 30s and 40s, we begin to fully understand what we believe about God. He says it's not until that point that, that we start wrestling with our faith in a real and meaningful way. He says it's also a great time of struggle. It's during this time in our life that we discover that there are inconsistencies in the faith that we were taught as children. It's great to say that God is love and that God loves everybody, but what do we do with other people who believe so differently than we do? Why does evil exist? Why isn't God's justice consistent? Why are there so many churches or religions? Does God love liberals? Does God love conservatives? Do I really have to love others? Really? Really do I have to love others? How many of you asked that question? <laughs> really? And sometimes we will feel like we do when, I don't know if you've had this experience. Anybody ever been at the Atlanta airport on Delta Airlines? And you, you're so happy that you're boarding on time and you're thinking, in the next 15 minutes, we're going to get in the air. Now, the thing about Atlanta Airport, the captain usually gets on and says, uh, sorry, guys, uh, it's going to be about another 25 minutes. We're waiting for 55 other airplanes to take off in front of us. <laughs> Anybody ever been stuck on the tarmac in an airplane? And it starts getting hot. And you start demanding water, and you want to strike, but you know that they're going to just throw you into jail if you do. I mean, that's kind of how I feel our faith gets stuck in our lives, that we're stuck on the tarmac, and then... Sometimes we launch and we're ready to go off, and sometimes we turn around back to go to the gate and we get off the plane. You see, and that, that happens for many people in their 30s and 40s that, that eventually this whole God stuff just doesn't make enough sense. And they don't, wanna, they don't have the time to wrestle with the inconsistencies. And then there are others who become very dualistic in their thinking. There is a right and there is a wrong, and everything I believe is right, and what everybody else believes is wrong, and I'm going to tell you what that is, and, and you go 
and talk to these people and, and enough, you realize that, that it's their biases and they can't see them. And, and you're like, well, how do you believe that? And how do you believe that? It's not the Bible I read. And how many of you encounter people like that? And then there are people in our lives that we know just have no time to spend on spiritual matters. Life is too busy and stressful, and I've got to take care of mom and dad, and I've got to take care of our kids, and I don't have time to think about God. And I think a lot of those people place God on, on a shelf or in the back of the closet, and God starts gathering dust. But then there are others who rise to, to have a complex understanding of faith. During the summer of love, as they discover what love is and what love is not, as they have these uh, you know, deep epiphanies about 1 Corinthians 13 and about what it means for God to say that all of us are very good, well, they discover that God, that the God we believe in is a deep mystery, and, and not in the sense that it's a mystery that we can never understand. It is in that mystery that reveals God's self to us in new ways each and every day. Have you ever been surprised by God? Have you ever been surprised that, that you say, oh, wow, I never thought about that before. And God is doing something brand new in my life. And how amazing is that? That's the type of spirituality that, that some of us can experience. That it's not a mystery that says that God is unknowing. It's a mystery that says God is so amazing. And some of us will discover that God is more than just the bumper sticker theology of a particular denomination or spiritual leader or self-help guru or a book. And some will even be able to share that vision and discovery with others and become the spiritual leaders that this world needs. And maybe you think Gandhi of that way or maybe Mother Teresa as people who have been strong and powerful spiritual leaders that have led us to see something in a new and different way. So my encouragement for you today is, is to know that God is there for you. Just a few weeks ago, we heard about the Holy Spirit and about those disciples who were scared and up in the upper room, and Jesus had left them at this point, again for a second time, and they didn't know what to do next. Jesus said, I'm, I'm sending the advocate. He'll be there with you. Just wait. Well, they were closer to God than we are, we are in, in time and space and history. And we know, though, that their journey of faith is no easier than ours. The book of Acts, the letter of Paul and James and Peter and John, they all testify to the difficulty that the early church had in understanding and transmitting the faith. But like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life, in you. May life be in you this week. Next week, my father-in-law, Wesley Wellborn, will share his testimony about being in that season of life I call falling into winter. And maybe it's not the best analogy of we're just using the four seasons. <coughs> Richard Rohr likes to say that life is divided into two halves, the first half and the second half. And I guess that makes sense. And Truth is, uh, this falling into winter season that I like to describe, it's not something that I know from my own personal experience. I only know it as a, as a preacher who's watched many of you go through that time. Something I've witnessed is I've held the hands of, of, of people dying in the hospital or, or as I've given hugs to those who've lost loved ones. And I am blessed to have my father-in-law come and give you some wisdom. And so I encourage you to come back next week as we learn about our physical and our emotional and spiritual life. Amen. So we are